Okay, guys, hope you're enjoying your Labor Day weekend. I know I used it to get caught up on some videos. So let me tell you what's coming down the pipe that I got finished and will be coming out soon. First of all, I finished my in acoustic tour series videos. Now it's going to be their reference room and music clips. And when we did A B testing of their cables against their own cables in the line, as well as Home Depot uh, power strips and power cords. So you're going to love that part. Also, when I went to Costa Mesa for the Home Entertainment Show, I visited a longtime subscriber and member, Michael, who has the uh, Linkwitz LX521.4. Fabulous system, and he has a lot of similarities to my system with mini DSP, using Dirac, open baffle, and very competitive and similar to uh, the quality you can get uh, from open baffles like GR Research and Linkwitz that can compete with cost no object. So you're going to be able to hear music clips as well as a walkthrough. And I also try to address an FAQ I get of which open baffles are the best since I'm known as Mr. Open Baffle. Uh, so I try to address that in the video as well. Also got the million dollar acapella spherons when I revisited that. That video is coming soon. But what I wanted to do today is put a bow on Doug's ultimate install video because I was so impressed by you guys uh, enjoying that video we got into the weeds but i decided to go ahead and release some of the bonus footage that i had recorded showing you more steps in the process and also more of the weeds <laughs> this was a very complex install i tried to give you that one video that summarized it but now you're going to get to see before during after some additional weeds that again i was so impressed that you guys are enjoying that type of content. That's exactly the type of content I want to put out, kind of makes me different. And if there's anything I can move the needle in the hobby, it's focusing less on reviewers putting their associated gear at the end. And let's see some measurement and pictures of their room to go with that gear. It's not just the gear as the prior video shows and you're going to see even more and it's not just about measurements alone you're going to hear in this video about it's important how you interpret the measurements and what suite of measurements you use not just one piece of measurement so this is very good for people that like to get into the weeds or like to at least know what they don't know you know it's fine whatever stage in the hobby you are right now on your journey totally fine just don't pretend that you know more than you know or are you going to look kind of foolish, always saying, this is the best, and then three weeks later, oh, no, wait, this is the best, or this is the best, this is the best. Understand where you are, have some self-awareness, and then start leveraging either your own time and learning more or getting the help or expertise to come out to your house like JR and myself and others can do to help you get that. And so without further ado, enjoy this next step. It's also going to focus highly on vinyl stuff. So I have chapters for those that are interested in different parts. Hope you enjoy, guys. Okay, guys, or maybe I should say, okay, OGs. Oh, How many have been subscribers long enough to recognize this house? It's my friend Doug's, who you've seen as recently as probably the uh, beautiful home um, and beautiful wine stuff. I'll capture that later. But probably remember this elevator. Remember, we got on it with the MBLs <laughs> that almost crashed. <laughs> uh, the guys for three million <laughs> near miss when it almost dropped when we did the install of the MBL 101s. You can watch those videos if you haven't. We did also a video out here when he installed the RHEL 25. And now we're installing, if you've watched YouTube Shorts, the Dolman turntable, the Bach and doing a swarm sub. And we're also using DS audio cartridge and the Meitner phono stage that goes along with it. So this is a pretty extensive, uh, it's already been an amazing system, one of the best I've ever been in at somebody's home. And now it's getting even more amazing. So let's see what's going on. JR. <laughs> like Hello. exactly how I pictured JR. Over a turntable turn with, yes. And flip flops, of course. That's right. flip -flops. <laughs> so most of you guys remember JR, Wally Tools, the guy to go to for your cartridge alignment. And he does these uh, engagements where he can fly out to your place. Uh, and we're going to be doing even more than cartridge setup, which is what he's most known for. We're going to do a swarm system. So we'll have a lot more on that, but I won't bother you too much. We've got chaos all over here. <laughs> right, Doug? Yes. 
It looks great. I think it's perfect. <laughs> this is how it's meant These to be. These are all sound treatments. So this is the before. Yes, yeah, sound treatments. <laughs> We got a new RT time, 60 time, with these boxes here. Actually, boxes, actually it's the Bach that we're installing, the Bach audio, and we got a camera kind of hidden there. And what's really cool is in acoustic power cables, these things are a beast. They look beautiful um, with the MBL 101s and Steve McCormick's custom mono blocks. Just to walk you through, in case you haven't seen prior videos, got a REL 25 sub. I have a whole video for that install. We've done a video with Steve on these custom mono blocks that he does. Custom aesthetic to your request. The MBL 101s, the install of that, as I mentioned. He's got a home theater actual MBL with surrounds. So, and then we're going to be putting in four subs uh to three more subs to accentuate the rel 25. there's the box back there you don't have to have access to it uh, once it's a, it's a set and forget it controlled by an ipad it's an aeon cd player and then we've got a lampazator server and another uh, smc audio pieces the vre2 it's a custom preamp it's got a separate power supply then if you're a Furman, and then this is the Dolman with a minus K platform built into the, uh, it just, well, I have it loaded right now. Can't yeah, that's what we're going to basically isolate it as good as possible from vibrations, which as JR has shown in other videos, like a, what is it? A hundredth of a millimeter. You can hear the differences people have heard. Oh, with yeah, calibration. It goes, down, it goes down to the nanometer range. Nanometer, mm -hmm. okay. Yep. So just one level of vibration. If you think you've got a Ginkgo or whatever platform, those are good, definitely. But a minus K gives you that nanometer level um, additional help yeah. in isolation. Now he's got the Meitner Phono Stage, which is for the DS Audio cartridge. And definitely interested in hearing this. This is not a combination I've heard yet. Uh, the DS Audio cartridge. Which one do we have? The Master? The Master 3. Master, Master three. 3. Okay, and it was shipped to JR ahead of time so he could do all the analysis, the, yeah. the analysis and calibration, and that's a fantastic cartridge. So this is the preview of the before, guys. We're going to do a session with Edgar in uh, about 30 minutes where we'll set up the Bach and then we're going to do the swarm and the turntable. So lots of footage to come. Okay, I'm going to whisper because uh, JR is actually on the speakerphone right now with Mark Doman for the turntable. That's the first Mark III Doman in the, you know, that's, and so to have JR and the actual owner of the turntable walking through the setup is a huge plus. But showing you, if you haven't seen Doug's guitar collection before, this is Fish, he's a big Fish fan. Mesa Boogie, guitar amp. So he plays in a little band. Okay, I don't, I don't see that. Who I've also featured, and actually, the um, cover art from my so channel has off. me up on stage. Pretending to sing. He got this one in Houston. A tailor. Really nice. This is new. I haven't seen it. This one before. And the sundry other things. He's got an RME baby face. Not for the Bach, but for pro use uh, with his okay, guitar so playing the, the bottom of the arm board is of course and then the for those who don't know he play. also has a big time headphone rig it's got the mod right trist amp sennheiser's 800s modified oppo by mod right really a killer combination so Yep, we're knee deep in things, but just to show you, we got people all the way from Australia with Mark Doman on the line. 
helping JR with this first uh, Mark III Doman. Okay guys, I'm gonna give you an update. And this is why the best gear in the world and, the, and your best ears still cannot beat what we are able to tell with these measurements, both in-ear measurements last night with the Bach and um, JR's Clio measurements. We are able to find um, specific bounce that he has at the, was that the five? Yeah, so right, right, so here's the original signal right here. That's the original arrival. This enormous bounce, we isolated that, that's the ceiling. Yeah. And it's all, it, it spectrally got, spectrally got more energy than the arrival signal. So when you look at a room like this, this is the takeaway, guys. People are going to make judgments. Oh, it's going to be uh, this wall or this thing. You know, we actually took measurements and did blocking this wall with treatments, blocking that wall, doing different things. What we did to find out where that reflection was actually coming from, you can do this at your home when you're taking measurements. We put a pillow above the mic to block ceiling reflections, and that killed big it. killed so we know now to treat here. The other thing that JR, again, having somebody like JR come out with these measurement tools, we were able to find exactly where his reflection point on the back wall was. Instead of coating this with just mass, in fact, this isn't really helping, not hurting, but not really helping. This is where the treatment needs to be. When we put stuff here, again, translates to the measurements. So doing this smartly and just not mass treating and over deadening your room is very important. And that's what we're learning today and why it's very important, not just to have great gear, to have expertise and the tools to diagnose this and get true improvements, not just aesthetic or hypothetical improvements. So just want to give you that update. The, the, the white line, what the white line is, 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 is included, is, it, it, it's, it's the frequency response from 500 to 20K approximately, including the ceiling bounce, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, then I went and I gated off the green line is without the ceiling bounce. As you can see, this frequency response actually gets worse. This is why you shouldn't rely just on frequency response to tell you whether you've got improvements to make. Because the, 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 the bounce, the, the noise that you get from the bounces when they are high amplitude and near in time to the arrival signal can actually cause a smoothing response, but it's, 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 an art, it's artificial. It's right. not helpful to the brain. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, the brain is still having to wrestle with. Wait, did I hear two things or one thing? Not sure how I'm going to um, tell tell you how to identify exactly where that thing is. So I'm going to give you a blob instead of giving you a pinpoint and nice separation of instruments. Right. I'm going to give you blobs. All right. And so th this is a good example of why you don't look at frequency response alone and to determine whether you're heading in the right direction. It's well, more, one yeah, the, the, it's a takeaway that I've just kind of made is that the measurements can be helpful and they can hurt you depending on who's interpreting them yeah. and knowing what it tells you yeah. and combinations. And so that's where we have the expertise here. Don't pretend guys that you know what you're doing and you can interpret a frequency response or impulse response. If you don't know, get somebody to do it that knows how to do it. It'll save you so much time or pretending that you know what's, because like he said, you may think you got a smoother frequency response, but you're not hearing it <laughs> because of the uh, offsetting reflections that could, in this case, be more detrimental. Yeah. All right, so documenting the next step in the process. We took some room measurements, as you saw, just to get reflection points, general room interactions with and without the sub with his existing system. Then JR went around the room using a Clio measurement system, pink noise, to kind of find, now that we're putting a swarm in of four subs, and it's even mismatched subs that need to be identical. These are gonna be all SVS. Um, because these SVS, gotta give them props. They have much more controllability and um, 
being able to tweak the phase all through from, from an app, much more control than uh, rel gives you. But in any case, the rel, we can use it. Um, I would not do a swarm of rels. Uh, the SVS has more controls. That being said, he found the best base, number one, to put the first sub. Now we're gonna add the sub, do some measurements, then we find the next best spot. And as we go, we'll put that swarm in. And then we'll be able to compare his prior measurements with just the MBLs, the MBLs with the rel, that's what he had the options of before. And then once we put the swarm in, we'll see the difference in the measurements in the base. Again, having this expertise, ability to do swarm, something that not everybody can do. Sometimes you have to hire people to do it. It's worth the investment, guys. Just learning exactly where to put room treatments, as I was saying, uh, alone versus just, you know, haphazardly and then guessing and then claiming that it works no get the exact spot because you can over treat rooms very easily uh, as well as put things where they don't really do much which we found these aren't doing too much right now all right another update coming soon to have when you measure your vertical tracking force that it's done at the height of the record okay this is a five gram calibration weight take a look 5.003 fine that i mean that's for all intents and purposes spot on here, okay, 5.015. All right, it is 15 thousandths of a gram heavy. Fine, it's not worth worrying about right now. All I wanted you to do is show, wanted to do at this point is show that how much they agree with each other, and which is to say a great deal. Now, we'll measure here, and this one, what is the vertical tracking for us? And we're gonna get, as soon as it, there it is, 2.1, 2. 2. okay? Now, let's switch scales, which we've already agreed, essentially agree with each other. Now what? Now, there is 1.0.15 grams difference. Now that is significant, mm -hmm. okay? Why? Because up, huh? it's reading the, the, the force at too high of a level. This, I've modified, this platform, I've modified, I, it's easy for me to bend it down so that when the stylus lands on the target, it is almost exactly the thickness of a record high above the platter. This is a function of the fact that the, 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 the um, center of gravity of this tone arm is not perfectly coincident with the, um, the, the, the axis, the horizontal axis of the arm. So um, this is why I prefer this less expensive model versus that more expensive model. Interesting. <laughs> okay. And why, if you're going to continue to use this, this is fine. But on this arm, you will have to, if you're going to continue to use it, on this arm, you'll have to take whatever reading you see and add 0 0.15 in your head of what the real tracking force is. Interesting. All right. That's not in your manual. That's not, no, <laughs> no, no, so there it is. Piggybacks on what we talked about uh, in the long form video. Again, having expertise, experience, a lot of people will not even know about this at all. No, no, no. Okay. Trough there. Great stuff. And that trough there are meant to fill with um, viscous mm -hmm. fluid. They're meant to be dr uh, uh, damping troughs. There's an armature that normally gets screwed into there to stick that then sits in that uh, viscous fluid in order to act as a damping mechanism. I suggest you don't use them at all. My personal feeling, and this would take a while to go into the details as well, but let me just give, give you the subjective answer. I feel, in particular, I, I feel that it robs the uh, subjective experience of energy. You'll lose energy and drive and dynamic impact. This is particularly true when you already have a table that is beautifully isolated. Now, if you had a table that wasn't nearly as well isolated, I'd say maybe we have to consider one or both of those, either horizontal or vertical damping. Okay. So, and, and I'm just gonna recommend we don't use it. Perfect. Okay. Um, the, this, this is the locking lever to then be able to change vertical tracking mm -hmm. height. 
Uh, we're just going to not ever use that. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's already ideal. But um, maybe about three months from now, if you want to experiment with that, call me and I'll walk you through it. Okay. Um, these counterweight armatures, that's the fine counterweight um, and that's the coarse. Gotcha. All right. So you probably will never have to change this, this one here. Okay. All right. And in fact, I'm just going to make sure that these are screwed against each other nicely. Yep. Okay. I want to screw them against each other so mm -hmm. that they don't easily unwind. Understand. Okay. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about this loop of wire. That loop of wire carries with it a significant risk of causing a horizontal torque on the arm. Okay. Okay. All loops of wires do. And certainly uh, on this brand, as I know Kuzma's very well, they, they don't escape this risk. Well, what, what's the problem with having horizontal torque on the arm? There are several, um, but what, here's what we know. That the, style, the cantilever, which is about six millimeters long, right? Mm -hmm. Six millimeters long, and then at the end of the, the cantilever, there's a damper. Uh, it, it's an elastomer. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a plate there. In, this is an optical cartridge, so it doesn't have what's called a coil former, mm -hmm. but they're effectively using one, and that's what's pressed into that damper. Mm -hmm. It's about two millimeters wide. Okay, So there's a lever force function here. For every one unit of force down here, horizontally, translates into six times the amount of force up there and minus six on the other side. Mm -hmm. Remember, it's a lever arm, mm -hmm. so six to one ratio, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that damper performs a really important function, and we want to have a symmetrically loaded damper. Mm -hmm. When they put that stylus cantilever assembly in the cartridge, they do some tugging against that damper, mm -hmm. and then cinch down. Once they've done an, enough compression, then they cinch down the whole assembly, and that, that compression mm -hmm. is then lives constantly there to keep that coil former um, a properly aligned in the magnetic flux field. Again, you don't have a flux field here, mm -hmm. but you've got other mechanisms right. at play that are equally important. And, um, and to provide a mean reversioning, purposing um, uh, function to get that cantilever back to its mean position, mm -hmm. rather than if you deflect it over here and it stays. It stays, right. Right? Or worse, it's undamped. It gets deflected and then right? Well, that won't happen in a groove. But without some damping, you'll get some resonant forces mm -hmm. that will build up. So we want to know that the arm is symmetrically loaded horizontally at all times. Now, when you when the the wall skater, I want you to use twice a year to check for the health of that loop is okay. basically what we're after. All right. Now, right now, the anti skating is set, and you can tell because see this armature here. Mm -hmm. You see that 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 there's a there is a filament on that pulley. You see that filament on the so. pulley? Can... Yeah, I see it. That's okay. Yeah. yeah, that that's how we know that that it, that the um, that the anti skate is loaded. It's loaded by the the the, 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 the this mass okay. that's on that armature. And the further down this armature that counterweight um, is, the greater the force that will be applied horizontally on the arm. So. What we're after here with anti-skating set is 10%, uh, which is to say every, if you come to this side now, and let's make sure that you got to make sure the stylus is about two to three millimeters above the platter and that your VTF is set properly. All right, and then I'll give it a, just a little, little nudge like that. Now, if you look at the line, come over here. If you look at the line that the plump, oh, shoot, I'm on the wrong side. I've got this on the wrong side, sorry. Hold on just a second. We're going to go inwards. Sorry about that. Let me reset. Okay. All right. It's going to be a little bit more at the inner area. Now, if you look at the line that the plumb bob is pointing at, mm -hmm. can count. How many lines till the yellow string is intersecting that lower beam? Mm -hmm. And you're going to read it's about 11. Yep, yep. That's fine. Okay. Okay. It's a little bit heavier on the inner area than the outer area. 
because this loop is getting twisted a little bit harder. What I'm concerned about is that, <clears throat> and I'm not entirely sure why it, it happens. I've got some hypotheses, but I'm not sure. That over time with, with perhaps changing ambient temperatures in the room, mm -hmm. and you know, remember, inside of this loop of twisted loop of wire, uh, is metal, mm -hmm. and then there's polymer, polymer around the metals, mm -hmm. and those have been twisted hard. They've been torqued, mm -hmm. and I, I suspect that they want they and want to untorque. Bit. Yeah. Okay. And 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 as time goes by, that relax that force finds its natural way about itself, and okay. will impart as it untorques will import a hor uh, will will impart a horizontal torque force against the arm. And that will change over time. So I want twice a year to get this out, make sure that the so horizontal force is in check. So it's not going to like check. 14, 15, yeah, 16, that's right. gotcha. Okay. That's right. Because what will happen sonically, sonically, when your horizontal force um, forces are out of control, um, it, it just causes an, an over, a couple things happen. One, the music sounds less relaxed. Mm -hmm. And it will happen so gradually over time you won't notice it, mm -hmm. all right? The music just has less of a relaxing, organic feel to it, and it sounds a little bit more mechanical mm -hmm. sounding. And the sound stage is a little bit more compressed and tightened up. Mm -hmm. Just th there's less air, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? Um, to, to use a very um, poorly defined term in our hobby. Um, so... Keep an eye on those horizontal forces. So twice a year, get this out. Okay. Check that out. And I'll get you one of these. Um, don't let me forget. Because okay. these are so much safer and easier to use than the legacy version that you okay. have. Okay. Um, so those, those are the, the main things now uh, for the arm that I want you to know about. Okay. Keep us uh, so... So if that tracking force does get out of whack... <clears throat> Yeah. I mean, are you adjusting it just with that little filament? Is, is that is that what you use to adjust that horizontal tracking force? The the, the, it, the this part right here. Little so little. that's the horizontal. Um, that's the anti skating force. Correct. So yes, you would change the position of that armature. Mm -hmm. Now it's already maxed out to the highest, as okay. you can see. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, if that ever becomes too much, mm -hmm. which is a genuine risk, mm -hmm. Kuzma has a smaller weight. Gotcha. That you can get so have to, to change that for, and most I'd say about sixty percent of arms that I see need that smaller weight. Okay, it depends on the native horizontal torque force that that torque that this wire is imparting. Mm -hmm. So before I even set that, before mm -hmm. I even align the cartridge, I put the whole thing on the Wally skater with the anti skate completely off to see how much horizontal torque force is being added mm -hmm. to the system. By that wire. wire. Yeah. I had to take this whole barrel connector off, rotate it 360, put it back on again in order to alleviate some of the force. Jeez, okay. It's very common. Uh -huh. And if I hadn't done that, and I didn't know that the horizontal torque force existed, then at the time that I aligned that cartridge to the Wally tractor, mm -hmm. what happens, you, of course, you got to lower the stylus to the null point. Right. And as you do, what happens if there's a horizontal torque force? What happens? It goes, bip! Like this, mm -hmm. right? Because there's a horizontal torque force pushing mm -hmm. the cantilever that way. Now you're so so you're good. looking at it from here. You think you need to rotate the cartridge to get it aligned. You don't. Mm -hmm. It's a visual error that's mm -hmm. occurring because of that horizontal torque force. Gotcha. Right. A lot of people misalign their cartridges just from the start because they right. don't know there's a torque force already pushing one or the other. Interesting. Um, and and so uh, yeah, for this arm, that's what I want you to know. Those things. So keep that in so I don't want you to put this the, your scale away, your VTF scale away, mm -hmm. particularly n n because it's new. I just want you to watch out for changing behaviors in the arm. So watch that VTF, watch, uh, watch, and then use this. Okay. okay, use this even in a couple months. Okay, all right, because it's so new. Gotcha. All right. Moral of the story: Don't touch anything unless you. Yes. <laughs> well, also a moral of the story: A good takeaway is. Getting the right tool. This is a big takeaway all weekend. The right tools, the right measurements, the right interpretation of these measurements, and what you see translates to what you hear and optimal performance. Again, oh, well, there would be no sense in bothering with all of this minutia if we couldn't hear the difference. That's right. <laughs> right. But when we're talking about nanometer level uh, mechanical playback device, 
everything could potentially matter. So yeah, great yes. job. This is going to be uh, eye and ear candy for vinyl lovers. For people like me, digital, eh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, it just I, it just know, confirms. It actually know. confirms why I don't have a turntable. Well, thank you for helping <laughs> if, me there. If I heard you correctly yesterday, what was the yeah. comment that you made after the very first record listening? What was that comment? Well, that's true. <laughs> it <laughs> sounded great. It. <laughs> it won't. It was good. You might have made, especially we played some gorillas. It sounded great. Yeah, and, and I've heard this, uh, the Dolman, uh, different model, but at Rick Brown's with lacquers. Yeah. That's, if I got into vinyl, I would be doing selecto stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. Really cool. Um, probably wearing those lacquers out pretty fast. But in any case, yeah, it's a phenomenal playback device, and I can see why people still love them. It's just a pain in the ass. So, but you get the less of a pain of the ass if you hire somebody like JR, which is what I would do, yep. uh, and get great material. Call Rick Brown, call me or call JR. We'll hook you up with just some similar thing that we did here at Doug's if you're interested.